there's just so much more that we can do now. I think our generation is starting to understand that, that we're not just supposed to shut up and dribble. Hey everyone, I'm Noah Lichtenstein from Crossover VC. Today we're going to be talking about marketplaces and the gig economy. And I'm excited to be teaming up with my friend Festus Azili from the NBA. Festus moved to America from Nigeria when he was 14 years old, learned how to play basketball, and has played five years in the NBA, including winning a championship in 2015 with the Golden State Warriors. And today we're catching up with Leah Sullivan, the founder of TaskRabbit, one of the pioneers of the peer-to-peer economy, having raised over $50 million in venture capital funding before being acquired by IKEA in 2017 and changing the way people complete tasks every day. Festus, Leah, thank you so much for taking the time. I think just to kick things off, Leah, can you tell us what is TaskRabbit and kind of how did you come up with the idea? Well, first off, Noah, thank you so much for putting this together. I'm so excited to be here and to get to meet Festus and chat with him. This is going to be so much fun. So um, I founded TaskRabbit back in 2008. I started TaskRabbit at a time where it was insane to jump into a stranger's car, let alone invite a stranger to your home. But the premise was, can we connect a neighborhood of people and create a marketplace where you can get errands, small jobs, and tasks done and outsource them. And so it became this online and mobile marketplace where you could post jobs for, you know, grocery delivery, dry cleaning pickups, house cleanings, whatever it is you needed. And so I ran the company um, as CEO for almost a decade. It was a crazy journey, lots of ups and downs. Um, But it's been exciting to look back, particularly at this time, is when I started TaskRabbit, it was in 2008 during the Great Recession. And mm. I saw the market go all the way up. And of course now, right, we're coming way back down. Um, and it's kind of this new phase of entrepreneurship that I feel like is a little bit familiar to me. Um, so yeah, that is that is TaskRabbit in a nutshell. Leah, your story is amazing. And, and the way you bet on yourself, the way that you had this vision, what was it about the time that you felt like was right for this? People can see it, people can fathom it, but what made you believe in that vision? Yeah, it's a great question. And looking back, I think you have to be a little bit insane sometimes to be an entrepreneur, right? <laughs> like <laughs> yeah. decide you're gonna like build something no one else has done before. But um, I was an engineer at IBM for eight years, love technology. And at the time, there were three emerging technologies that I got really excited about as a developer. Um, The iPhone had just come out four months earlier. So it was brand new to market. The app store had just launched. It was very early. Facebook was just coming out of the college scene and kind of becoming more mainstream. This concept of social networking that was pretty new. And then no one was really utilizing the location-based awareness of your phone inside your applications. And so literally, I was at home one night. I was living in Boston at the time. I was at a dog food one night, and I was like, there's got to be a way to get this dog food. Like, I'm willing to pay someone. Maybe there's someone at the store at this very second. Like, why can't I just connect with them? Like, this should exist. We have all the technology now to make this happen. And so as an engineer, I got really excited about the technology. Um, And so I ended up quitting my job at IBM four months later to build the first version of the TaskRabbit site and get it launched in Boston. And then it kind of snowballed from there. You know, for me, I realized that entrepreneurship was something that tapped into kind of my whole self and really pushed me to, to be better at a lot of different things and areas I wasn't familiar with. But I think that instead of being paralyzed by all the things that I didn't know how to do, I just made the choice that I was going to believe in myself enough to figure it out. And I'm sure, like, I bet that resonates with you. I mean, your story is incredible. You came from a different country here. What did you say? You you thought you were going to be a doctor? Yeah, and that then, was my, my, my track my whole life. I was supposed to be a doctor. And then coming here, that was the plan. But then yeah. basketball came in and, yeah, changed the, the, the track and the trajectory. How did you decide that you were going to pursue basketball over medicine? So the whole idea of even starting to play basketball was 
me at 16 coming to America. And the idea behind it was if I played basketball, that I could get a scholarship and I would go study medicine, which is what my dream was and what I always wanted to do. Well, how the flip happened was at some point, um, one of the people who I really admire is Dikembe Mutombo, right? And his story, he had the same similar vision, right? As a foreigner coming to America, it's a very steady job. It's something that, you know, that's the way we want to help people as well, especially coming from Africa with kind of a poor healthcare system sometimes. So um, he had this idea of being a doctor. But then he, I remember him saying something along the lines of, you could be one doctor in one hospital in one city, or you could be like me and have built several hospitals with thousands of doctors on payroll and helping so many millions of people. So when I thought about it that way, I felt like my purpose was much bigger than that. And so the betting and taking, it, it felt like I was still moving in the same direction, but just with a different focus. Yeah, that's incredible. And I know that you do have a lot of projects you're involved in and what are sort of your passion projects? Absolutely. Um, well, I always, I say this all the time that first and foremost, I'm a big, I'm a storyteller, right? That's the thing that I enjoy the most. I love reading people's stories. I love, for example, we have, we just watched the Michael Jordan Last Dance documentary. And I think of Michael Jordan as a god of basketball, right? He's somebody that's untouchable. But as we're watching this documentary, he's very human, right? So many instances, he has done what you did during your time, like he bet on himself, right? He just had this belief. So for me, I think that being able to tell people these stories, there is a mental aspect to that, that that helps people get through whatever they're going through, understanding that they're not alone. And so in going to, you know, the more that I gain, you know, fame and notoriety, I want to use that to help kids to understand that they're not alone. So um, I'm partners with the YMCA in the Bay Area. Um, you know, I'm doing some things in Africa. Um, as it relates to the healthcare system, there's some things that I've invested in as well. But yeah, no, it's just like we have this platform, so why not use it? Use it for the betterment of the of the of the world. That's kind of how I I see the the basketball platform. On that note, Festus, um, so how did coming to the Warriors sort of open your eyes to this world of tech and maybe just the opportunities as an athlete to use your platform for for more than you know just playing sports? I think it made me realize that it's really not that far off, right? Because, you know, now you get to see a bunch of athletes in the tech world, whether it's Andre Godali, you see Steph Curry, you see Kevin Durant, LeBron James. We have a platform in the fact that people follow the trends, right? It's the same thing in technology, it's the same thing in real life. And just in terms of people want to do the things that they see other people doing, right? And so we can now leverage that attention to, you know, whether, whether it's, you know, get stock in companies, understanding that we can grow the equity of companies with just the eyes that are on us and people seeing us and people paying attention to the things that we do, or just with the fact that we can also learn. We can learn and, and get ready for post-career activities or post-basketball playing uh, careers. So I think that there's, there's just so much more that we can do now. And I think our generation is starting to understand the that we're not just supposed to shut up and dribble. We're supposed to use this to do other things. Yeah, so who did, you, who did you lean on to for support? You had never, you never raised money before, right? Yeah. You, were, you were an engineer, so you knew how to build it, but yeah. how did you turn it into a business? What are the things, who, who helped you and supported you along the way? I didn't even understand how to raise money. I remember someone told me like, oh, you, there are people that have money that will just like, back you build this company and I was like who are these people like I where do you find people that have money that just want to give money to me and then I was like but what if it doesn't work do I have to give the money back like I don't understand how this works there was a huge learning curve and so um you know I just networked so hard like I just met so many people I talked to anyone who would listen to me so it was a lot of hustle, a lot of networking. You know, these are not people I knew ahead of time. Again, I was just like so passionate about the technology and about the idea. Like I was just willing to like knock down doors to figure out how to do it. 
Wow, that's yeah. really inspiring. When you go through something like this and you're building something this great, there has to be a moment where you're like, man, like I really made a mistake. Or was there any time like that um, for you that you could tell us like a specific event? Yeah, I mean, it was a crazy journey, tons of ups and downs, tons of things I look back on that I wish I did differently. You know, when I started in 2008, it was a really, really tough economic time. I had quit my job at IBM in June. I cashed out my IBM pension, which was $28,000. And I thought, okay, $28,000 will carry me through the end of this year, like six months, I'll make it work. And I get to the end of the year, the stock market crashes, no one is writing checks, investors are like closed up shop. And I'm thinking, like every day I wake up and I'm thinking like, am I still doing this? Does this make sense? Like. I'm maxing out credit cards, completely bootstrapping. And it was, you know, part insanity, part belief in what I was doing. Um, and just being super scrappy about how I was operating. But it was like those early days were really, really hard every day. I wasn't sure if I should just quit or not. I, I'm kind of curious about that because like, while you're going through those bootstrapping days, right? how do you know when when to give up right how do you know ah oh, this is not working or did you have something did you have milestones where it's like i know that i'm not making money yet but i see yeah. that people really need this here's the, here's the thing investors at the time you know because of market conditions weren't engaging but the customers loved the service and particularly the taskers, the people that were out running errands, making money. Oh and yeah. So overwhelmed with people that wanted to make money on the platform. And so as hard as 2008 was from a, from a market standpoint, it was the best time to launch a company like TaskRabbit because we were enabling this new way of working. And so that was the North star. That was the guidance. That's what I had to bet on. And then I just had to wait really until the markets came back enough to, to actually build it out to scale. I thought about that. You said there's a recession, so there's no jobs, right? Yeah. And then, uh, cause I was wondering how much of this was a factor, right? And you're yeah. pursuing it or how much of it was the, was the motivating factor as, as you started going? It was huge. And you know what, if I had started the company a year later in 2009, once things had improved, I don't know, would it have turned out differently? Maybe, but there was certainly a lot of momentum in 2008 into 2009 for people looking for work. Um, and then that became the base, that became the foundation really to build the company off. Since we're talking about the recession and the fact that we're in one right now, can you give advice to people who have ideas, but they feel like right now it's not the right time because there's no money, there's no jobs, like things don't look bright. What yeah. kind of advice, because you built something that was great during that time and you went through it. So what kind of advice would you give people in that, in that situation? So I think now is an awesome time to build a company. It is one of the most exciting times to build a company, but it's gotta be the right company. It's gotta be the right product. And now is such a great time for innovation because the consumer mindset is shifting so dramatically. And the easiest time to introduce a new behavior or new innovation to a customer is when their world has been flipped upside down and they don't know which way is up. And that is how I feel these days um, as, a, as a consumer. And areas that I'm excited about are things like remote work, online education, you know, telemedicine, digital health. These are all areas that need rapid innovations because of what's going on in our world right now. You know, if you look back to the last financial crisis back in 08, 09, some yeah. of the, com the companies that define our society now were founded then. Uber, yeah. Lyft, Dropbox, TaskRabbit, Twilio. Yeah. Yeah. So, it's funny, if you actually look back at the financial returns for people who invested out of downturns, they're actually some of the best years to both start companies uh, and to invest. And so um, I, I, I like, like like you, Leah, I'm, I'm so excited and bullish in spite of, you know, what's kind of happening. Um, 
So guys, this this has been incredible, and I wish we could sit here and talk for. Yeah, is it over? We have so much more to get into. Oh man, yeah, really. You're not you're not quite off the hook yet because we we like to end each episode with a rapid fire series of questions. So, are you guys ready for your rapid fire? Yes. Let's do this. All right. So first question. If there was one task that you would be an expert at to be a tasker on TaskRabbit, what would that be that you'd, you'd complete? I am really good at organization. Give me chaos and I will give you organization. Well, I'm, I'm really tall, so I can help people get stuff from the tall parts of the show. <laughs> so, is, that, is that, that a task? <laughs> I need that help. Oh my God. I am 4'11". So you are? Yes. Oh yeah, for sure. You can hire me any day. What's the first thing you do in the morning after you wake up? The first thing I do is I meditate. So I turn on the calm app and I meditate for ten minutes every morning. I check my phone <laughs> like a, an obsessive compulsive crazy person. What is your quarantine cheat food? Everything. <laughs> we eat everything. Oh, uh, and there are no rules right now. Yeah, I'm also 23 weeks pregnant. And- Congratulations. Thank you. I'm obsessed with Milk Bar, all their cakes and pies and cookies. Like it's just, everything is out the window. It's crazy. What's one thing about you that people who don't know you would be surprised to learn? I'm actually an introvert. So for the shelter in place, I feel like I've been training my entire life for this moment and I'm just crushing it. I like to write. I'm working on a book. That's something nice. that's nice. That's new. <laughs> that's awesome. So, what's one thing that you haven't been able to do during all this craziness? That is the first thing when this all ends. It's the first thing you're gonna go out and do. Pedicure. <laughs> <laughs> I'm coming. I want to piggyback off that. That's not fabulous. You know what? Fine, I'll, I'll join. We'll, we'll all go get uh, <laughs> all right. Your haircut, just anything <laughs> grooming, massage. I just, I, yeah. I miss hugs. Hugs, <laughs> yeah. Oh man, uh, that's, uh, that sounds good. But Leah and, and Festus, thank you guys so much for taking the time and for sharing your stories. I really appreciate it. Thank yeah. you. For this is awesome. Thanks again for stopping by the crossover. You can give our guests a follow here and here. And check back with us soon for more Founder Stories. Thanks for watching ESPN on YouTube. For live streaming sports and premium content, subscribe to ESPN+. Plus.